so uh, I realized using the term offline after having a, a, a talk about desktop Ember apps may be a little misleading. Uh, when, when I'm speaking of offline, I'm, I'm talking about lack of network connectivity. Um, and we're going to talk about how we can take our Ember apps and work with them offline. And I'd like to start with telling you a story on, on how I got started building offline web apps. Uh, and it actually started with a medical condition. Uh, this medical condition is called uh, hydrocephalus. And this is water on the brain. So basically, infants get this where uh, the water builds and, and there's no way to relieve the pressure. It's deadly if it's not treated, but with uh, treatment, you can live a normal life. The little boy here in green, he was treated and you know is a fine student living a normal life. Uh, so I was introduced to this uh, because I work for an organization called Cure International. And we're a nonprofit. We work in 30 countries. Uh, and we operate hospitals and programs uh, in the developing world. And we treat conditions like hydrocephalus, clubfoot, cleft palate. Um, and so back in 2012, I was presented with a unique problem. There was a researcher over at Harvard Medical who wanted to be able to uh, do some research on these hydrocephalus cases, uh, be able to you know, kind of do some quality assurance, see if the methodologies being used were really effective. And the problem was we needed to collect this data in locations throughout Africa where internet connectivity was iffy at best. Um, and sometimes expensive. Uh, so we needed something that could work offline. And so I took the time to learn how to build an offline app. Now this was back in 2013, and so application cache was just kind of coming into fruition, and offline storage was, was kind of a new thing. Um, but we successfully deployed uh, in 2013, and to me, it proved that offline web apps could work well in the developing world where internet connectivity isn't guaranteed. Um, now, this was a solution for a specialty program we had. But we actually have a network of hospitals. And it got me thinking, OK, so if we could do offline web apps for uh, one program, why can't we do it for all our hospitals? So the, the current methodology of if you're going to a mobile clinic, you'd have to do something uh, like we see in this picture here where all the medical records get loaded into these bins, and then the bins get shipped off to a, a clinic in you know, a rural Uganda um, where patients can be seen. And you know, as a developer, I look at that and think, well, why can't I just load that onto a laptop? Why can't I just build something that, that will take that along? So I um, thought that you know, this is a solvable problem. And then I thought more, too, about the fact of well, you know, at a hospital, there, there's more than just medical records. Uh, hospitals need to be able to take care of things like inventory. And, and maybe uh, to help pay the bills, you might have private patients. So maybe you need to do something with billing. So uh, the beginning of uh, 2015, uh, I started work on this project called Hospital Run. Hospital Run is a hospital information system uh, for charitable hospitals in the developing world. And it's built on Ember. Uh, it's built uh, for offline and online use. Um, it's an open source project. And one of the things we really wanted to be cognizant of was usability. So I don't know if any of you have any experience in the medical field. But um, if, even if you talk to people working in US hospitals, a lot of people are frustrated with the software they have to work with. It's a pain in the butt. It doesn't always do what you want to. So we wanted to create something that was simple, um, but also was approachable. So, so that's kind of a, a little bit of the background of Hospital Run. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it as I go on. But I just kind of want to introduce some of the context of what got me building offline apps. So at this point, you may be thinking, OK, offline apps, Africa, yeah, net, bad network connectivity. Like, that sounds great. That's a good, feel-good story. But like, I'm a developer here in the States. My clients have great bandwidth. You know, why should I care about offline apps? Well, here's why. The internet is being attacked by sharks, guys. Like, did, did you know this? Like, I, I mean, like, 
I, I don't want to, you know, be like, you know, some like fanatic, like offline, but, but, but the Google tells me this, so. But, okay, so seriously, um, this actually is a, tr is a real article, and it, I think it's more link bait than anything else, but um, I think it brings up a point. Uh, we face internet outages um, sometimes daily, and we don't even think about it. Maybe you're in the subway, maybe you're at a conference and there's not Wi-Fi everywhere, um, or maybe you're somewhere where the cell towers just aren't working. Um, and the thing is, we tend to treat offline or think about it as just kind of something we deal with, because it's usually temporary if, if we have to deal with it at all. Um, and so we think, well, it's not, it's not that big of a problem, and, and maybe we think too, it's too hard of a problem to solve. And I'm here to tell you it's an easy problem to solve, and we'll get into that in a minute. Another reason you might want to care about offline is that there are performance gains that can be had by offline apps. Uh, if your data is local versus on a server, uh, access is a lot quicker. There's another reason, um, and that's with a properly crafted offline app, server downtime becomes completely irre irrelevant. Um, I, I love this tweet here where this guy's thinking about it, he's saying, well, you know, I need to reboot my database server. What about my users? Well, because his app was built for offline, he doesn't have to care about that. He can reboot his server. Um, there could be a denial of service attack on his server. He doesn't care. Um, so, so, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, another reason, or, or another thing to think about is, does your app really need a back end? Could you run your app without a back end? Let's say you just had a simple to-do app. Well, most of that data is local to that user. Sure, you might use online access for something like backup, but there's actually room for these apps that just live completely offline. Uh, so earlier, uh, Estelle showed us uh, how we could build desktop apps. Some of the things I'm going to talk about today could be put into practice in um, a desktop app using the same approaches uh, for an offline app. So hopefully by now you can kind of see why offline is important, or, or at least maybe why you should think about it. Um, and as we think about offline app development, uh, there's an approach that we really can take, and it's called offline first. And um, you know, I was thinking about who, who really knows about offline first, and I thought about the first like offline animals and it's dinosaurs and womp womp womp. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay, so um, but okay, here's here here's the point. You want to treat offline as the baseline for your app. Um, think about that as like your minimal viable condition for running your app. If 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 your app can live offline, it can live anywhere. So. So, so we kind of start as that, that is our baseline, and then we build up from there. We use internet connectivity, online connectivity as a luxury. We use it when we have it. So there's a site, uh, offlinefirst.org, and they've kind of really started this conversation about offline first apps. Um, and they have this great quote, I think, where it's talking about, you know, um, not just having like this desktop uh, approach where we think, okay, we always have a connection, we always have that wired LAN connection. Um, and I think there's one part of this quote that's really important, and it's this, stop treating error as an offline, st sorry, stop treating offline as an error condition. And if there's anything you take away from this talk, I, I hope you at least consider this. Um, really, like, we don't have an excuse as developers to do so. Um, so, yeah, just stop. <laughs> um, so how do we build for offline first? Uh, so I really think, and, I don't know why, but this uh, seems to resonate with me, is we need to develop a survivor mentality. So maybe you guys heard of this movie, um, Unbroken, where, where this guy, Louis Zamparelli, or Zamparini, um, in 1943, he was uh, part of a crew of 11 men who crashed in the Pacific Ocean. Louis and one of his crewmates uh, survived for 47 days at sea, living on captured rainwater and, and fish that they caught. Um, and they survived because they collected what they needed when it was available. Uh, same thing with offline. We need to use connectivity when we have it so that we can work offline. So let's take a look at how we can do that. So the first thing we need 
for an offline web app is a way to store our app offline. Uh, and the way we can do this, or one of the ways we can do this, is by using application cache. Now, maybe you guys have heard of application cache. Maybe you've even heard bad things about application cache. But the funny thing is, for an Ember app, it actually works really well. Uh, so to use application cache, uh, you create a manifest file, and it lists all your resources that you need for your app to work offline. So think of you know, your JS, your um, CSS, any images, that, that kind of thing. Um, and application cache always, uh, all the resources you declare in there are always pulled out of the cache, whether you're online or offline. So you have to keep that in mind. And um, you have to keep track of like a version number so that when your, uh, when your app updates, the, um, the cache is also updated. Now, fortunately, uh, in Ember, this is like dead stupid simple. Um, so like if you're doing an Ember CLI app, all you need to do is install Broccoli Manifest. Um, there, there is a small uh, bit of boilerplate that has to go in your index um, HTML. Uh, but once we have that in place, the app just works offline. Now, when I say it just works offline, uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't things that you need to do, but our app structure. And, and so um, I'd like to show just a, a quick demo here of, of how that works. All right, so we're going to switch. All right, so let's just say we have our we have our, we have our app running here on localhost 4200. It's our fun to-do list. Um, nothing exciting, but, but it'll prove a point. OK, so if I come over here and I kill my server and then come back here, uh, yeah, my app doesn't work. And this is just a plain vanilla Ember app. But if I come over here and run the same, this is the same app, the only difference is uh, Broccoli Manifest is installed. So let me give it a second here. Let's see, make sure our app is up. Okay, app's up. We're going to kill our app here. And it works. So, so there, there's a very simple thing you can do. Now, the caveat here is, is this app, none of, none of the data is coming from a server. It's all local. So, so there wasn't any need to, to fetch that data. So um, which actually brings me back to my next point, which uh, is, what do we do about storage? So let's say I have a to-do list. Um, that data needs to come from somewhere. And in the browser today, we have uh, basically three mechanisms for offline storage. There's local storage. It's also called web storage. And this is a key value pair, um, kind of like cookies. Uh, it's a synchronous API, so it's really meant for like small, small amounts of data. I, I wouldn't use it for a, a large data set, but if, if you just need to store little bits. Um, then the next option is Web SQL. Now, Web SQL is SQL in your database. This is actually a deprecated spec, but it's still available in most browsers except for Firefox and IE. And then the last option is IndexedDB. This is, I guess, the most recent offline storage available. It's a NoSQL database, uh, so it's like this object store that uses key value pairs. So when we talk about offline, well, talk about offline data persistence in Ember, um, if you're using Ember data, there's a couple adapters that you can uh, use. Local storage uses local storage. Uh, there's another one called Local Forage, which is a wrapper that Mozilla built that uses either IndexedDB or or Web SQL. Um, and then the last one I'm going to talk about is PouchDB, and that this is. Um, it uses IndexedDB or Web SQL behind the scenes, but it's actually an implementation of CouchDB, uh, which is a NoSQL database, uh, stores 
uh, everything in documents and uses keys to reference them. And uh, for hospital run, this is what we use, we chose to use um, for our, our project. And, and the reason we chose to use it is mainly because it synchronizes nicely with CouchDB. So in the browser, we have PouchDB running, and then in the server, we have uh, Couch running. And so what, what we can do is we can synchronize between the two, and then everyone who's, who's looking at the you know, patient records, they, they get the most updated records because synchronization is happening. Um, and we kind of get that for free with, with Couch and Pouch. Now, we've learned a couple things in using Pouch um, in, in our Amber app. Um, search can be tricky because you're dealing with a NoSQL database. So you can't just do like select star from blah where X is like foo. Um, so, so, but there's stuff you knew with like MapReduce as well as there's a couple plugins um, that, that are useful. Um, another thing we realized is you need to think about how much data you're going to be storing on the client. Uh, our initial implementation, we were just syncing down the whole database and we realized, well, wait a minute, there's some users who really only need patient data. They don't care about the inventory system. So you need to think about how you can partition that data so that you only bring down what you need. Um, and then also you need to consider your infrastructure. We found that we had some uh, people using older machines um, and we were syncing too often for, uh, basically their, their browsers were getting hung up because we we're, were syncing too often. Um, so we had to adjust that. So speaking of synchronization, um, anytime you work with offline data, synchronization to online, it's actually a really hard problem. Um, and I know because when I built the hydrocephalus system, I did it all by hand and it's complicated. Um, it's kind of like building Git from scratch. Uh, I mean, maybe not completely, but you get the concept. Um, so when you think about synchronization, the first thing I would ask is like, do you really need it? If your data is per user, maybe you, you can just get away with syncing um, just that user's data, and so you don't have two people changing the same data set. Um, and actually, we found that Couch and Pouch do a great job of synchronizing, um, even if two parties change. But e even with, with that, uh, even with good synchronization, you still have to handle conflicts. And actually, Ember makes this really easy. Um, so there's different str uh, strategies for handling conflicts when synchronizing data. But a pattern that works a lot of the time is to let the last change in win. So if user A changes the first name, yesterday and I change the name today, I should win. Now, if we did that at a record level, um, we could end up overwriting non-conflicting changes. But in Ember data, we actually have access to this changed attributes on a record. So I can tell on each save what fields were changed. And then what we do is we just simply keep track. We have a, another field that keeps track of timestamps of what fields were changed when. So if we get two different records in, two different copies of the same record in, we can compare, okay, you changed it yesterday, I changed it today, I win. Um, and we just do that on server side to, to resolve those conflicts. Okay, so, you know, we've, we've looked at how to store app structure offline using application cache. We've looked at how to store data, or data. <laughs> well, let me tell you about data. <laughs> How to store our data uh, with, with, with browser storage and, and hopefully giving you a little picture of what it means to deal with offline online sync. Um, but there's something new that we can do online and that's uh, service workers. Um, so service workers take uh, what's automated by application cache and puts the controller back in your hands. So uh, if you remember or from what you've seen of application cache, it's very declarative. You say these resources are available offline, this stuff is only available via network. It's all very declarative, but you don't have much control over it. Um, you can kind of think of service workers as giving you a proxy server in the browser. You have, you have control over network requests. So you can say, okay, pull it from the cache or pull it from the network or 
you know, um, or come up with a custom response depending on whatever you decide. Today's Tuesday, so you get bad data. I don't know. Um, uh, so any, anyway, um, that you, you can do you can do more without. You can do more with service workers than you do with than you could do with application cache. So one example, so with traditional application cache, you have to store your data offline if you if you want to have access to it. With service workers, you could actually cache your API calls so that if you're offline, you just respond back with the cache version of the API call. You don't have to change your code to to say, oh, well, I'm offline, so go fetch it from the database as opposed to fetching it from some online resource, you're calling the same data point. Now, obviously, if you start writing stuff, then if you need to write stuff offline, then uh, you need storage. Um, but that, this is some of what Service Workers gives us. So how do they fit into Ember? Well, I thought it was funny. Uh, the other day, Tom Dale tweeted um, that he wants to make Service Workers something Ember apps largely get for free. And I'm like, all right, cool. Like, that's awesome. Like, if we can do that, that sounds really good. So I had a thought. OK, so there's this thing called Broccoli Manifest. Well, maybe, maybe there's a bro broccoli service worker. <laughs> but I ran into a problem. Broccoli and service and worker are really common terms. And, and I really wasn't looking how to make broccoli. So um, but, but you know, I dug a little deeper. You know, there wasn't any, anything in NPM, so um, I decided to make it. Uh, so you can now do service workers in Ember. Uh, this is a very new thing. Um, and right now, it pretty much works like the Broccoli Manifest does. Uh, but uh, eventually, you know, hopefully we can do things like cache API calls and, and, and really take advantage of some of the things that service workers give us. Um, so I can give a quick demo here, I think. All right, so we have, all right, so, so this is another app, um, same app actually, um, but now we are running uh, let's just refresh and make sure we got the right one. So, so, so now, now we're running with Service Worker, and we should be able to look at the source just to make sure. Okay, so really, really big. Um, so really, at the bottom, it's it's just really this piece here where we're pulling in a Service Worker um, that's been generated, and so we'll, let's go kill our app again. And it's up. So, um, so service workers, you can use them today. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, they are only in Chrome um, without any like special things. You can use them in Firefox if you use the nightly build. I think uh, Firefox is going to have it available by the fall. Um, oh, and uh, Opera as well has it. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's service workers. Um, and that's it. So uh, thanks a lot. Questions for John? Questions about offline Ember service workers? Um go <laughs> so what are, what are your what's your opinion about service workers and ember as a first class citizen and what type of is that something that you think that your library can be incorporated or is this something that have to be a completely separate effort um so it that's a great question because one of the nice things about service workers is it gives the control back to developers uh for dealing with offline resources so i think the question becomes how much control do you want as a developer and how much do you want to have auto-generated for you? Um, the, 
there are a couple like patterns when, when you start talking about offline development um, where I think those things could be boilerplate. So, so, so I think whether it's a uh, broccoli service worker or something built into the um, framework itself, I think those use cases could be kind of automatic. And then if you wanted to deep dive in, I, I think it, it could be done um, kind of you know, on, on your own project. So that makes sense. Any more? Oh. Maybe it's a little loaded, but how do you deal with privacy of medical records? <laughs> yeah. General, so, kind of general approach, because I know it's a big question. Yeah, uh, so one of the uh, benefits in, in dealing with the developing world is, is we don't have a lot of the... Um, <laughs> we, we, we don't have a lot of the, the legal ramifications, but, but at the same time, like, Patient integrity or, or patient, you know, privacy is something that that we do care about. Um, so, uh, so it, I mean, the one simple thing is, is you know just running everything over SSL, um, and then beyond that, it, yeah, it's it's a thorny issue. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> 